James chapter 5. Man, we have a lot to say and a lot to cover here tonight. But before we do that, let's, uh, let's go before the Lord, shall we? Heavenly Father, we are excited to hear from you tonight. God, we know that the book of James is a strong book. God, it's a, it's a book full of uh, strong points. It's a, it's, a, it's a book that doesn't pull punches. And God, oftentimes we need that in our lives. When we don't know what's going on, when we get off on the wrong path and we kind of follow our own selfish desires, God, we need to hear your voice. And so we thank you so much for the author of the book of James that so confidently and so strongly calls out things in our lives. God, I pray, speak to us all individually with that still small voice you have or that big strong voice you have, God. I pray that as we go through this tonight, God, that you convict us where we need to be convicted and that you build us up where we need to be built up, Father. And I pray that as we go through this word, may we fall more madly in love with you. And we pray all of this in your son's name. Hmm. And God, I pray, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be holy and acceptable unto you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. Amen. All right, James chapter 5, Oof, starting in verse 1. Oh boy, come now you rich, weep and howl for your miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches are corrupted and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver are corroded and their corrosion will be a witness against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You have heaped up treasures in the last days. Uh Uh-oh. This might be, oh no, is this going to be one of those turn or burn messages? Is this going to be those, one of those messages where there's condemnation? Oh boy, well, maybe, we'll see, we'll find out together. But Hebrews chapter, or excuse me, James chapter 5 starts out with a bang. It starts out with a serious punch and says, Come now, you rich, weep and howl for your miseries that are coming upon you. We, uh, I joked last week about James chapter 4 where it says, um, where, where essentially there are a lot of Bible verses that are tattooed on people. There are a lot of Bible verses that are over the, the eaves of someone's door. I haven't seen James 5.1 over the eave of someone's door. Come now, you rich, weep and howl. <laughs> so what is going on here? Why, why does James talk about this? Well, if we go back a couple of verses in James chapter 4, Um, James is talking about selfish ambition. In fact, let's, let's just read James chapter 4, verse 13 through 17. It says, Come now, you who say, Today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a city, spend half a year there, buy and sell and make a profit, whereas you don't know what will happen tomorrow. For what is your life? Is it even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away? Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we shall live and do this or that. But now you boast in your arrogance, and all boasting is evil. Therefore, to him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is sin. Come now, you rich, weep and howl for your miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches are corrupted and your garments are moth-eaten. Oof! For those who don't know, James is the half-brother of Jesus. And James, like I said before, he doesn't pull punches. He is a man that says it like it is, and he tells you straight up, hey, you might be living in sin if this is what's happening, if this is what's happening. You're living for yourself. You have selfish ambitions, and ultimately you haven't made God your God. You've made yourself God. Now, why is that applicable to us? Why is these verses that were written some 2,000 years ago, how can they be applied to us? Caleb, I can't even make rent this month. Obviously, I'm not rich. Well, I did a bit of digging and I did a bit of sleuthing. Um, And if you make more than $10,000 a year, you are in the top 30% of all income in the entire world. And if you make more than $100,000 a year, you are in the top 10%. 
And I don't know if anyone here makes over a million dollars a year, but then if you are, you're in the top 1.2% of all income in the world. So, yeah, like I said, if you make more than $10,000 a year, you are, by most, by most standards, considered rich. I am, I am considered rich. And that's an interesting thing because when we look at this passage, often we think of billionaires and millionaires and bazillionaires and go, oh, well, obviously they are rich, but I'm not. I'm, I'm still struggling to get by. But here's the thing. 150 years ago, these things that we take for granted would be things that God, or excuse me, would be things that kings themselves would have desperately desired. I was thinking about it um, a couple of hours ago, and I was like, you know, if, if I am bored at any time, with two flicks of my thumb, I can be watching as much entertainment as humanly possible. The kings of old had to wait until their jester appeared, or the kings of old had to wait until there was a show to watch. We have running water, we have running plumbing, and we have, for the most parts, we have heat. We are by all means considered blessed. And so we need to be careful in this. You know, I don't know about you, but this morning I woke up and I made myself some toast and I made myself some eggs and I pulled them out of the fridge and I just put it together and I sat down and I ate it and I moved on with my day and I forgot to thank God for it. Because... It's good to go. We're good to go. I'm relying on my own strength. We're fine. And in this, we see that, oh, man. Well, we'll get there here in a second. But there's a few things to realize because we have been blessed so much. There's a few things to realize because we have been given so much. Again, if you compare yourself with the lives of those Jewish Christians some 2,000 years ago, we've got it really good. Really good. But what does James say? He says, come now, you rich, weep and howl for your miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches are corrupted and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver are corroded and their corrosion will be a witness against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You have heaped up treasures in the last days. Indeed, the wages of the laborers who mowed, who mowed your field which you have kept back by fraud, cry out. And the cries of the reapers have reached the ears of the Lord of Sabaoth. You have lived on the earth in pleasure and luxury. You have fattened your hearts as in the day of slaughter. You have condemned, you have murdered the just. You do not, he does not resist you. Oof, man. I hope you guys are ready for a, for a positive message here. But it's difficult. You know, we read this and we go, well, this doesn't apply to me. This is for, you know, this is for my boss or my boss's boss or the CEO of my company. But ultimately, if we, like those people in James chapter 4 who was saying, you know what, in one year I'm going to, you know, I'm going to move out of state and I'm going to buy this house and I'm going to go work at this company and I'm going to take care of this. Have you included God in that plan? It often reminds me, uh, Jesus talks about the, the man who uh, has a bountiful harvest. He's an older guy, probably around 50, 55, and, you know, he has a huge crop, and he looks around and he goes, hey, I think I've made it. I think I'm good. I don't think I'm going to have to work ever again. So you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to tear down my barns. I'm going to build bigger barns, and I'm just going to fill them full of this year's harvest and I'm not going to have to worry ever again. And God comes to that man in that parable and he says, Hey, eat, drink, and be merry, for tonight's your last. What does it profit a man if he gains the entire world, but yet loses his own soul? Where do our desires lie? Where does our heart lie? What are we striving for? Because ultimately, if it is for our own uh, selfish ambition, if it's for our own gain and it's due to the detriment of everyone else around us and we haven't included Jesus and we haven't included God, 
then be careful. Because though having a goal is a good thing, don't get me wrong there, it's a good thing to desire something. But when that desire comes above God, the maker and the ruler, the the one that owns the cattle on a thousand hills, and we start to strive to the detriment of everybody else around us for our own gain, then we have a problem. In fact, there's a few things, there's a handful of notes here in James chapter 5 that I just want to point out. Uh, Verse 3, the key takeaway here is you have heaped up treasures on the last day. So number one, if you have wealth, don't hoard it. That's great that God has blessed you. It's good to be a good steward of of what God has given you. But if God says, hey, give that guy 20 bucks, or God says, hey, pay for that person's meal, or if God tells you to do something with your finances, with what God has blessed you with, and you don't do that, you're putting your own selfish ambitions above God. And it's so easy to do that. You know, the children of Israel in uh, Deuteronomy chapter 8, uh, I'm going to turn there. Feel free to, but no, no pressure either way. <laughs> but in Deuteronomy chapter 8, Moses is talking to the children of Israel. You know, they once were slaves. They walked through the wilderness. Those that resisted God had all died, and that second generation uh, is now following Moses into the promised land. And the last speech that Moses makes before he goes up to the mountain and dies is this. And in excuse me, Deuteronomy chapter 8, I'm going to go, um, let's see, hmm. in verse 7, and I'm just going to kind of hop between verses, verses 7 through 19, give or take. For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land, a land of brooks of waters, of fountains and springs that flow out of the valleys and hills, a land of wheat and barley, a land of in which you will eat bread without scarcity, in which you will lack nothing, a land whose stones are iron and out of whose hills you can dig copper. Verse 10, when you have eaten and are full, then you shall bless the Lord your God for the good land which he has given you. Beware that you do not forget the Lord your God by not keeping his commandments, his judgments and his statutes, which I command you today. When your heart is lifted up and you forget the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, who led you through the great and terrible wilderness, then you will say in your heart, my power and the might of my hand have gained me this wealth. And you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant, which he swore to your fathers as it is in that day. Then it shall be if you by any means forget the Lord your God and follow other gods and serve them and worship them. I testify against you this day that you shall surely perish. So like the children of Israel, when my belly is full and when my bed is warm and when everything is going all right, I don't pray to God. I go, you know what? Life's good. This is all right. I'm doing good here. And that's a scary place to be. Why is it then when we are in trouble, we cry out to God? Why is it then when we're in pain, we cry out to God? Why is it when, that when we need food, when we need something, we cry out to God? We always need God. But oftentimes it's because we've been satisfied when our belly is full, when our life is all right, when the internet bill's been paid, then we forget. We forget who is God, and then we start looking at other things as if anything aside from God can satisfy us. And that's what's being talked about here in James. It's not don't be wealthy, don't, you know, like which, you know, maybe that's what God has called you to. But it is, don't put the love of money above God. 
In fact, it says in 1 John that the love of money is the beginning of all kinds of evil. It's when you desire, oh, even Jesus says, you cannot serve both God and mammon. And mammon is, the, uh, is, is, is that God of money, is that God of affluence. For either you will love one and hate the other, So you have to choose. If God has put you in a position where he has blessed you, that's a good thing. But if your desires for your own wealth exceed your love for God, and if God has said, hey, like Jesus said to the rich young ruler, this one thing you lack, go and sell all that you own, give to the poor, come and follow me and you go away sad, then ultimately your God isn't God. You are your own God. And that's not to be the case. Die to ourselves daily. Pick up our cross and follow after Him. Even Jesus, when He was in the Garden of Gethsemane, you know, He's sweating blood. He doesn't, like, He's, he's freaking out because he, He's about to go through incredible pain and turmoil. And he says, God, if there be any other way, take this cup of suffering away from me. But what? Not my will, but your will be done. So though we have our own desires, though we have our own things that we aspire to in life, if those ultimately take the place of God in our lives, may that not be so. If you are looking for something to satisfy you and it is not God, it will not satisfy. You will end empty and broken. I mean, talk to a brother or sister next to you. I'm sure they got a story. So if you are in a position where you have wealth, do not hoard it. But look to see who you can bless. Verse 4, indeed, the wages of the laborers who mowed your field, which you have kept back by fraud, cry out, and the cries of the reaper have reached the ears of the Lord of Sabaoth. Don't steal wealth. Don't reach out for wealth to the detriment of those around you. Don't climb up for some number and leave people in the wake of that. That's not, that is not befitting of a Christian. In verse 5, it says, You have lived the earth in pleasure and luxury. You have fattened your hearts as in a day of slaughter. We are not to waste wealth. If God has given us money, we are to use it for the building of not our kingdom, but for His kingdom. That's why, you know, yeah, if, if God has blessed you, we are supposed to tithe. We are supposed to give unto the church. Because ultimately, it's, not, it's never been our money. It was His money. So though having money is a good thing, be sure that it is not your God. Be sure that you are not striving for money, but simply look to serve God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. With everything that you do, run to God. There was a time in my life where I had just completely run out of money. And I've told this story, like, I couldn't even buy coffee. And God provided for me, and it was wild. If you've ever been there and you go, God, I don't know what to do, and you cry out, He will it's, it's crazy. If you're his son or his daughter, he'll provide for you. It's so cool. Yeah. Moving on, verse 7. Therefore, be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, waiting patiently for it until it receives the early and latter rains. You also be patient. Establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord is at hand. 
Do not grumble against one another, brethren, lest you be condemned. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. My brethren, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord and as, as an example of suffering and patience. Indeed, we count them blessed to endure. You have heard of the perseverance of Job and seen the end intended by the Lord, that the Lord is very compassionate and merciful. But above all, my brethren, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or with any other oath, but let your yes be yes and your no, no, lest you fall into judgment. Okay, so what's being talked about here? Well, James, the half-brother of Jesus, the leader of the church in Jerusalem, after Jesus ascended into heaven, he's talking to Jewish Christians here. And he starts out the book of James in chapter 1 saying, My brethren, consider it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that those trials produce patience, and when patience has fully formed, you will become perfect. And we talked about what is perfection and what does that look like, and that's found more in James chapter 2, and it's so cool. I highly recommend either go back and listen to it or read it on your own time. What does it mean to be perfect? So cool. But patience is the key to this perfection. And so James goes back and talks about patience once again because it is so pivotal in the life of a Christian. You know, Though, you know, though you might be in the world standards considered wealthy, maybe you're not able to pay rent. Maybe you're trying to figure something out. Maybe you don't have a job, or maybe there's just something in life that you... Man, the world and the weight of the world is resting on your shoulders, and you're going through what a lot of Christians call a hard season, a tough season. Hey, how you doing, brother? Oh, you know, just going through a tough season. And it's a season because oftentimes, as a Christian, you know, we are going through these times that farmers go through. I grew up in the Midwest, and so oftentimes I was surrounded by soybeans and sometimes corn if I went up to my grandparents' house. And in the winter, you, as we would drive up, there would be just barren fields with st- with corn stalks just completely chopped up, and the ground is hard, and the snow is covering the ground, and it's just dirty and gross and disgusting, and it's really cold. Maybe you're going through a time like that where there is no growth. Maybe you're just struggling to to survive, and it looks like nothing's growing. Maybe you're going through a hard winter season. Well, be patient. Be patient, brothers. Be patient, sisters. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Do not grumble against one another, lest you be condemned. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. My brethren, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord as an example of suffering and patience. But in verse 11, it says, Indeed, we we count those them blessed who endure... You have heard of the perseverance of Job and seen the end intended by the Lord, that the Lord is very compassionate and merciful. In what do we place our hope? In who do we place our hope? Do we place our hope in our own selfish ambitions? Do we place our hope in our own wealth? Do we place our hopes in our own dreams? Or do we place our hope in God? We know how this story ends. We know who wins. We know who holds the keys of sin and death. And that's Jesus our Lord. But oftentimes when life is going crazy and, you know, and work's going wild and I know people are talking behind my back and there's all of this wild stuff happening, I forget. I forget how this story ends. I forget that I'm not the main character. I forget that Jesus has broken 
sin's hold on me. I forget that Jesus is up in heaven preparing a place for us right now so that when we die, or if he takes us up, we will be forever with him. Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. And that's why we have to place our faith in Jesus and not in anything else, not in any other gods, not in any other hopes, whether that be wealth, that whether that be our own aspirations. In fact, oh man, I keep, I keep referencing 1 John. We're going to get there soon. Don't worry. Um, but in 1 John, it talks about the, these three things are, are basically what causes sin in our life, and that's the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. The same three things that Eve fell to. She looked upon the apple and saw that it was beautiful, was delicious, and desired to be like God. So the lust of the flesh, what things do we crave? The lust of the eyes, what things do we want? And the pride of life, those are aspirations, selfish aspirations. Those are the desire to be famous and to be well-liked and to be adored more than God. And these are the things that still cause us to fall away from God. So James warns about this in James 5. And what does he say? Therefore, be patient. Maybe things aren't going right in your life right now. Maybe things aren't going well right now, especially when you've done all these right things, when you're trying to the best ability of your ability to be a good person, to be a good Christian, and man, you're just getting slapped around. Be patient. We know who wins. We know who conquers death. We also have to realize that this was during a time that, like this book was written during a time of the beginning of the persecution of the Christian church. Like people were being torn out of their houses for believing in Jesus. Men were being ripped away from their wives and from their children and being sent to jail and death. And it was only going to get harder for those Christians. Nero, dominion, they hated Christians. Nero was, man, he would, he would light a Christian up as if he, they were a candle to light up his garden. This is the type of persecution that the Christian church would go through at that time. And in verse 11, he says, in the context of what is happening to those Christians, indeed, we count them blessed who endure. You're blessed if you hold on, if you cling on to God with everything. Life is hard, but it's so much harder without God. It's so much harder without hope. You have heard of the perseverance of Job and seen the end intended by the Lord. And the Lord is very compassionate and merciful. But above all, my brethren, let your yes be yes. Oh, excuse me. Do not swear either by heaven or by earth and with any other oath, but let your yes be yes and your no, no, lest you fall into judgment. I want to take a second and just talk about this. I, I joke around with my friends, but in California, oftentimes when someone says, yes, I'll be there, that means maybe I'll be there. And if someone says, ah, oh, I might be there, they, they ain't coming. And if someone says, no, I won't be there, they don't like you at all. <laughs> now, it was tough for me to learn this because people would say, oh, yeah, no, I'll come, I'll be there. And then they wouldn't show. And I go, oh, man, I, I don't know what's going on here. If they say maybe, I'll be. I was waiting. I was, I was eagerly expecting them to show up. And, and they never came. And I, I couldn't understand. But as Christians, we have to realize that our yes is to be yes. Our no is to be no. We're not supposed to swear one way or another, but if someone is relying upon us, simply say yes or no. 
There is a movie called The Crucible, uh, one of my favorites. Uh, it's uh, Daniel Day-Lewis plays in it, and it's talking about the Salem witch trials. trials and Daniel Day-Lewis is um, convicted for being a witch, and he's about to sign his name. And if you sign your name on this piece of paper and you confess that you're a witch, uh, you don't get hung, and you get to live free. Um, but ultimately, like, your name forever will be that you are a witch. And so he signs this piece of paper in order, to, in order to get out of being hung. And then he goes, well, wait, hold on. And he pulls it back and he scribbles his name out, knowing full well that what he's doing will lead him to death. And the, the people there are going, why? If you're a witch, so be it. Like, just confess it and go. And Daniel Day-Lewis says, because this is my name and I do not have another. If you say yes to something and you don't do it, that's your reputation. If you say no to something and you do it, that's your reputation. And so to the best of our abilities, as Christians, we are to be trustworthy. We are to follow after Jesus, whose yes was yes, whose no was no. You know, he was single-mindedly focused for the cross, for the liberation of all of mankind. And, you know, he, he said, again, like, if there be any other way, God, but not my will, but your will be done. And so his yes was yes, and his no was no. And so I'll leave that there. Um, but if someone asks you to do something and you don't want to offend them and you say, oh, yeah, I'll do that, and you have no intention of doing that, don't do that. The only person that that um, negatively affects is you. Verse 13. Oh, man. Oh, we've got time. This is going to be fun. And I, I, think, I thank God so much that this is how this book ends. That's how this chapter ends. Verse 13, it says, Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone among you cheerful? Let him sing psalms. If is anyone among you sick, let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayers of the faith will save the sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Elijah, verse 17, was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it didn't rain for three and a half years. And he prayed again, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its fruit. What's being talked about here? What's happening here? It's interesting. It says, is anyone, in verse 14, among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with the oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick, and the Lord will raise him up. I don't often tell this story. But when I was um, about, I was in fourth grade, um, I came down with some wild sickness. We still don't really know what it was. But there was a period of my life of about, I think, two or three months where I remember I was out playing uh, in the backyard and I, I just fell. I fell down to the ground and I couldn't get up. I, I literally couldn't pick myself up. I didn't have any strength and I crawled um, back to my house and pulled myself up and just like ran to my mom or walked to my mom. And for the next, I don't even know how long, for the next two or three months, um, my strength left me. I had these crazy fevers and... Um, I started being carried around in a wheelchair as half of my body went numb. I couldn't walk and I couldn't jump and I, I didn't know what was going on. Um, and 
yeah, it was, it was a really strange time. And my parents didn't know what to do either. We went to all these doctors and I spent so much time in the hospital and nobody knew what was going on. And I remember sitting in, my, in the sunroom on the first floor because I didn't have enough strength to get, up to, the, to get up to the second story. And I would look out at my neighborhood and I would see all the kids outside playing and running around. And I would just go, God, like, why can't I do that? Um, and it was the very first time in my life where I realized that I'm going to die, and that life is not infinite, and that my life will have an end. And that, you know, that was heavy. That was heavy for, for, for a 12-year-old, you know? Um, and so, so moving on, like, as... My, my parents had booked, this, uh, had booked this, this cruise to go through the Mediterranean with a church um, to follow the footsteps of Paul. And they had done that before I had gotten sick, and so we had just gone. Um, and uh, I was in a wheelchair for the majority of that time. And there was a pastor who um, had said, he actually had a, he had a, uh, it, there was a, there was a Colosseum that he was teaching in. He was talking about healing. And he was talking about how God is still moving, that the Holy Spirit is still real, and God still heals. And he says, if any of you are dealing with any sickness, come forward and we'll lay hands on you and we'll pray for you. And um, I came forward with my, with my mom and my dad, and he prayed for me, and nothing happened. Um, but we still had faith, you know? Um, we still, we still like, like I had faith that it was going to be all right. And I remember driving back and on the tour bus um, to get back to the, uh, to get back to the ship and a car smashed into the bus and I smashed my face into the, into the seat in front of me and bit through my lip and was bleeding everywhere. I was like, so much for faith. And so they, and so they, take, they take me and they rush me to the, uh, to the clinic on the, onto the ship. And they, you know, the doctor, this, this German guy is like, why so much blood? I'm like, stop bleeding. <laughs> like, and he cleaned me up. And the pastor that was praying for me before, he came down and he prayed for the, the healing of my lip. And what's funny is that at that moment, God healed my body. Like, I don't know, like, I still can't jump very well. I had to relearn how to walk. Um, but I started out that trip uh, unable to walk, unable to move for long durations of time. And I left that trip running, and the only thing that happened was someone prayed for me, and God healed me. And... Oftentimes, we as Christians, you know, we see our, our, more, our extremely more charismatic brothers and sisters uh, doing wild things and go, oh, well, that's just, you know, that's just not possible. Like, you can't do that stuff. But I'm living proof that healing happens. I, like, there are so many stories I could tell you. I've seen people healed from cancer. I, like... I like, and I've seen people being exercised, like, <laughs> like had having demons exercise out of their bodies, and I've seen, I, I've seen people be miraculously healed in wild ways, and God is real. The Holy Spirit is real. I've seen meth addicts turn into preachers. It's crazy. That doesn't happen simply by, you know, trying and manifesting and doing something. There is power in the name of Jesus. If any among you is sick, let him call upon the elders and may the elders anoint you with oil and may we ask for healing. It says it in the word. The Holy Spirit still moves. The gifts of the Spirit are still alive and well. And so we have oil tonight, and if you are sick, 
man, come forward. We're going to lay hands on you and we're going to pray for you. This will be after service. So, you know, we're not going to, we're not going to pause, but if you are dealing with a sickness, realize that the God who holds the atoms together, the God who holds every single breath in our lungs, the God that made the entire universe in six days says, hey, pray. Have the elders lay hands on you. And maybe, just maybe, we'll see healing. How cool is that? How cool is that to see healing? It's, it's wild. It's so crazy, but it's 100% real. And it's 100% true. It's so cool. Oh, man, where are we at? Okay, we have a few more minutes. Um, but yeah, yeah, all of it's real. That's the thing. The gifts of the Holy Spirit are so real. Um, tongues is real. Healing is 100% real. Um, God is real. It's not just a whole bunch of people like thinking in their heads, you know, singing kumbaya together. He is real. Verse 15, or verse 14. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Confess your trespasses to one another. Pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. And then James talks about Elijah, who was a prophet, but he was just a regular man like you and me. In fact, the Bible says that God has no favorites. So, which, which, oh man, God doesn't have favorites? He doesn't love me? No, He loves you equally as much as He loves Moses, as much as He loves Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, as much as He loved Deborah the prophet, as much as He loved Mary of Magdalene, or, you know, Mary the mother of Jesus. God loves us equally the same amount. And Elijah, though he was a man, he prayed for the heavens not to rain for three and a half years, and it didn't rain for three and a half years. You can read about that in 1 Kings 17 through, uh, through a couple other chapters. And, uh, but it says in verse 18, And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth produced fruit. Jesus says it another way. He says that if you have the faith of a mustard seed, you can call a mountain and cast it into the water. And if that's God's will, it will happen. So it's that little bit of faith. If you have a little bit of faith, it can move mountains. Verse 19. If anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone turns him back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save a soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. I have a few brothers in my life that, uh, that I went to school with that followed after the Lord more than I did. And I was, I looked up to these men. And specifically the two of them, they fell away from God. They, they turned away from God and went after their own selfish ambitions and have fallen deep into sin. And I pray for them. You know, uh, you know the story of Cain kills Abel, and then God comes up to Cain and goes, where's your brother? And Cain goes, what am I, my brother's keeper? Well, you are. If you have a brother or a sister, if you know someone that has fallen away from God, we're supposed to pray for them. Because it says in verse 19, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone turns him back... Let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his wave will save a soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. We know that the wages of sin is death. 
that without Jesus, <laughs> man, we're going to hell. If Jesus isn't our Lord, that's where we're going. But the free gift of life is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So you simply accept Jesus into your heart. And so if you know someone that's run after their own ambitions and they've made something their God that isn't God, then pray for them, petition for them, cry out for them. Because we know that the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man or woman avails much. God is so real. Jesus is so real. If you want joy inexpressible, if you want a life properly lived, if you want to be with the Creator, if you want to know what the purpose of your life is, you can talk to the one that made you. It's so cool. Faith moves mountains. The effective and fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. So as we conclude, let's pray. God, the book of James is a strong book. It convicts us where we need to be convicted, and it builds us up and encourages us where we need to be encouraged. God, I don't know what my brothers and sisters are going through. I just, I just know what I'm going through. God, and I know that uh, I, just, I just pray, God, for healing, and I pray that you move mightily among us, Father. And I pray that your Holy Spirit just falls upon us, God, and that young men uh, have visions and old men dream dreams, Father, and that we so vividly see you, God. I... And so, God, we pray to you tonight. May we be a light and a witness in a dark world. May we be like the moon, a reflection of the sun. May we be a holy city, excuse me, a holy city set upon a hill. And ultimately, may we love you with all of our whole heart, all of our soul, all of our mind, and all of our strength. We love you, Father. In your name we pray. Amen. This has been a presentation of Refuge Calvary Chapel Huntington Beach. For more information about our ministry, please visit refugefamily.com or call 714-891-9495.